Good morning. Uh, the reading this morning is taken uh, from Isaiah. It will be the entirety of chapter 60, uh, verses uh, 1 to 22, um, and it can be found on page uh, 748 um, in the Old Testament sections of the Bible. Uh, Isaiah chapter 60, starting at verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, the darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the people, but the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look upon you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you, the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah. And all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. All Keter's flocks will be gathered to you. The rams of Nabareth will serve you. They will all be accepted as offerings on my altar, and I will adorn my glorious temple. Who are these that fly along like clouds, like doves to their nests? Surely the islands look to me. In the lead are the ships from Tarshish, bringing your children from afar with their silver and gold to the honor of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, who has endowed you with splendor. Foreigners will rebuild your walls, and their kings will serve you. Though in anger I struck you, in favor I will show you compassion. Your gates will always stand open. They will never be shut day or night. So the people may bring you the wealth of the nations. Their kings led in triumphal procession for the nation or kingdom that will not serve you will perish. It will be utterly ruined. The glory of Lebanon will come to you with the juniper, the fir, and the cypress together to adorn my sanctuary. And I will glorify the place for my feet. The children of your oppressors will come bowing before you. All who despise you will bow down at your feet and will call you the city of the Lord, Zion of the Holy One of Israel. And though you had been forsaken and hated, with no one traveling through, I will make you the everlasting pride and the joy of all generations. You will drink the milk of nations and be nursed at royal breasts. Then you will know that I, the Lord, am your savior, your redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I'll bring you gold and silver in place of iron. Instead of wood, I will bring you bronze and iron in place of stone. I will make peace your governor and well-being 
your ruler. No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor ruin or destruction within your borders. But you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun will be no more, well, sorry, the sun will no more be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will win no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. Then all your people will be righteous, and they will possess the land forever. They are the shoot I have planted, the work of my hands, for the display of my splendor. The least of you will become a thousand, the smallest a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will do this swiftly. Thanks be to God. listening to uh, Ian Reap. After listening to Ian read that, uh, that chapter for us, I uh, almost feel the sermon's irrelevant, but, uh, <laughs> but I've prepared it, so here we go. <laughs> Let's pray, shall we? Our gracious Lord, we praise you and thank you for your word. Uh, and Father, as we look at this amazing chapter, pray that you would speak into our hearts and into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in case you hadn't noticed, we are two-thirds of the way through the general election campaign, and uh, I suspect that we have all heard the aspiring MPs and leaders laying out their stalls. Now, I'm not going to do a poll here, you'll be relieved to know, and I'm not going to tell you who I'm going to vote for, and I'm not going to tell you who I think you should vote for. But I was interested to reflect on what happens in a general election campaign. What happens is that we listen to our, uh, our political parties describe their ideal world and their plans to achieve their ideal world. Then we decide whether their ideal world matches our ideal world and whether we think they can achieve it. And then finally, we cast our vote or not on that basis. Now, now there is nothing wrong with that. As Christians, we know we live in a fallen world damaged by sin and our politicians have to work within that context. But what would our ideal world look like? And when we've worked out what our ideal world looks like, then elections inevitably give us a deep longing, don't they, for that ideal world. Because as Christians, the ideal world that we have in our hearts and in our minds is heaven itself, the eternity that God has set in our hearts. Now, God's people at the time of Isaiah weren't facing an election, but they had experienced years of bad leadership and they themselves had failed to live up to God's standards. Uh, we saw that in chapter 58 uh, a couple of weeks ago. And then last week in chapters 59 and 63, we saw God's solution to their sin, how he himself would destroy evil. 
And those who trust in him would receive his spirit and his word to live lives for him. God's promise will be fulfilled in the ideal world, the perfected city of Zion inhabited by God's people. So, so if you will, just set aside for a moment all the ideal worlds offered to us by our politicians over these last few weeks and come with me to catch a glimpse of God's promised new creation centered on the city of the Lord, Zion of the Holy One of God. What will it look like? What will it be like? Four things. First of all, it will be a place of light drawing people in. Looking here particularly at verses 1 to 3. Arise, shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Look, we're enjoying, aren't we, just a, a few days of sunshine after weeks of cloud and rain. And suddenly our moods change, don't they? And we rejoice in the light. But imagine if the world were in total darkness, which is Isaiah's spiritual assessment here in verse 2. And then suddenly... There is light. Suddenly, we can see the glory of God flooding the world. That's the picture here in Isaiah. The glory of the Lord rises upon you, verse 1. The Lord rises upon you, verse 2. The, his glory appears over you, verse 2. This is God's people, Zion, on whom the light shines. But of course, from our perspective, we know from the New Testament who this light is. John chapter 1, speaking of the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us, says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John 8, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so we know from our standpoint that Jesus is the light that rises upon God's people. And in Christ, in Jesus, we become the reflected light, as Carl was showing us earlier, that reflected light that draws people to the Lord. Verse 3 here, speaking of God's people, now the church. God says through Isaiah, nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And so we here, God's people at St. Nick's, will draw people to the true light, to God himself in Jesus. But that means, of course, that we must seek to live out, even in this sinful and dark world, the reality of God's promises to his people. We must be a light to the world, a light that points not to us, but to Jesus, to God. And our task, as God's people here, is to reflect that light out into the world. a place of light drawing people in but secondly it's a place of variety with all that is good in the world and we're looking particularly at verses four to nine although this comes right the way through the passage and the picture here in Isaiah 60 now moves to this new city this Zion the people of God and God says lift up your eyes lift up your eyes look about you let your hearts throb and swell with joy. See the people flooding towards you, says God. Sons from afar, daughters carried on the hip, verse 4. The, the ships with sails like clouds, bringing your children, verse 9. 
see the wealth and the good things of this world coming to you, says God here in Isaiah. The wealth of the seas, the riches of the nations in verse 5. Silver and gold and incense, verses 6 and 9. Flocks and camels, verses 6 and 7. And it's a reminder to us that although this world is damaged and tainted by sin, it is still good. It is still full of beautiful things that will endure for eternity. It's very easy, isn't it, for us to become cynical in a world where everything seems to be flawed or tainted. But we need to learn to see things with God's eyes. Oh, well, certainly we mustn't diminish the impact of sin and evil, but we need also to see the beauty of the world that God has created and to see the beauty of the many things that flow from our creativity made as we are in the image of the Creator God. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes and look about you, says the Lord. See that. And this new creation, this new Zion, will be filled with beautiful people. Now, without God's victory over sin in chapter 59 here, fulfilled in Christ, our beauty will always be tainted by sin. After all, sin rests in the hearts of people, each one of us, and not in objects, although those objects can and often do reflect the sin of those who made them. But in Christ, in the new people of God, in the church, God's people, you and I, are finally beautiful, drawn to him. Just look at the variety described here in these verses. This is no monochrome people of God, but a richness beyond our imagination. And the church reflects that with people from every tribe and language and nation across the globe. But why do these people and these things come into Zion? Why do they become part of the new people of God? They do so as worship and praise to God himself. They're not there for our selfish desires, but for the glory of the living God. Verse 7, they are to adorn my glorious temple, says God. That, that word temple is better translated as house because it's the place where God dwells amongst his people. That's here, amongst his people. Verse 9, to the honor of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. This is for the glory of God. And the people of St. Nick's, you and I, we are for the glory of God. It's a place of variety with all that is good in the world. But then thirdly, it is a place of security and salvation. And we're looking particularly at verses 10 through to 16 here. We've uh, spent some years working through the book of Isaiah, and if you can kind of think your way back, perhaps, to, through that, uh, those, uh, uh, those chapters of Isaiah, you'll see that Isaiah describes both God's challenge to sin, uh, the sin of his people, but also the judgment that his people would receive. Now, now that God himself has defeated evil, on behalf of his people. Those who trust him will find salvation and forgiveness. Just look down there at, uh, at verse 10 for a moment. Do you see? He says, though in anger I struck you, in favor I will show you compassion. In anger I struck you, and now in favor I will show you compassion. And so, 
as we would expect, this Zion, this people of God described here, is now a place where we can enjoy safety for eternity. Uh, and that is the picture of the rebuilt walls here in verse 10, and the permanently open gates in verse 11. Uh, I don't know whether you leave your door wide open at night. I suspect not, because it's not safe. But there, in the new city of God, we will be safe. Linda and I were walking back to uh, one of the car parks in Bath, in the centre of Bath, about uh, 10 o'clock last Wednesday. And I have to say, we did not feel safe. Bath is a beautiful city. It's not the city of God, but it is a beautiful city. But it is not a safe city. And we felt that same thing walking around other cities, and I suspect that is your experience as well. Don't we long for safety and security? But the city of the Lord is safe because it is the place where God meets with his people. It's the place for his feet, as we're told in verse 13. And that is the church. And the church is a safe place because it is a place of salvation. Do you see, the walls here are walls of salvation. The gates are gates of praise. And we need to reflect that in our relationships together as a church. No more judgment, no more oppression, no more insecurity. And as we experience that, and as others experience that amongst us, then Psalm 16 says, then you will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. You see, how we live out our relationships as church demonstrates to the world that the Lord is our Savior and our Redeemer. It's the place of security and salvation. But finally, it is a place of transformation. When we moved into our new home, when I retired, the kitchen needed changing. It, it was functional, and uh, I think the lady who lived there uh, hadn't changed the kitchen in 30 years, maybe even 40 years. So it was functional, it did its job. But the wooden cupboards and the old surfaces needed something different. Uh, they had had their day, but they were no longer appropriate for a new situation, new inhabitants. And that is exactly the picture we have here, isn't it, in Isaiah 60. So we have a description of God changing things. If you've got a Bible open, do you, do you see there in verses 17 and 18 in particular, but uh, right the way through that last section, do you see um, how often it says, instead of, in place of, no longer, no more. This is total transformation. Gold for bronze, silver for iron, bronze for wood, iron for stones. No more violence or destruction, but peace as your governor. And it says that, uh, that the Lord, you have no longer any need of the sun because the Lord is your light. Verse 19. There's no more sorrow. Isn't that wonderful? No more sorrow. It's echoed in Revelation ch uh, chapter 21, um, where, uh, uh, where uh, John hears these words, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. every way this Zion this city of the Lord will be transformed and above all its inhabitants you and I we will be transformed uh, someone once said that uh, communism sought to put a new coat 
on every person. But Christianity puts a new person in every coat. And that is the problem, isn't it, with every political ideology, every ideal world. Until you change the human heart, you cannot transform the world. But this picture here is of a transformed world with a transformed people. Just look at verse 21. Then all your people will be righteous, and they will possess the land forever. They are the shoot I have planted, the work of my hands for the display of my splendor. This is God's work. And the church, us, we, are God's work. I am not very good at gardening. I confess that. I stand before you and confess I am not very good at gardening. I don't really know which plants work best in which places in the garden. But as one writer says, God is the divine gardener. He knows exactly who to plant where, how to grow the shoots he has planted. He's planted you and me here. And we need to let him do his work in us, to plant us to grow us, to let him transform us by his word impacting us and by his spirit at work within us. Now, of course, we're uh, tempted to say, <laughs> but we're, we're only a tiny congregation. You know, the world is so much bigger. The world pokes fun at us. It derides us. It, uh, it laughs at us. It uh, thinks that we're hopeless. How can we possibly display God's splendor here? Get real. And God says to us, no. No, you get real. Verse 22. The least of you will become a thousand. The smallest, a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will do this swiftly. We have no excuse. No excuse. We are the people that God has put here for the display of his splendor. And so our lives individually and together need to demonstrate as transformed people, the transformed people that we are, God's splendor to the world. Because our light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon us in Jesus. John Newton was a slave trader who came to faith in Christ and like many people, like every person sorry, who trusts in Jesus, Newton himself was transformed. That's what we know and expect. Of course, in later life, he wrote Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But he also wrote the hymn, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken, Zion, City of Our God. And although it's based on, Psalm, uh, uh, based on Isaiah 55, it echoes so much of what we've just read in Isaiah 60. Let me just read to you two verses, the first verse and the last verse. Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God. He whose word cannot be broken formed thee for his own abode. On the rock of ages founded, what can shake thy sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, thou mayst smile at all thy foes. In the last verse, Saviour, since of Zion's city I, through grace, a member am, let the world deride or pity, I will glory in thy name. 
fading is the worldling's pleasures, all his boasted pomp and show, solid joys and lasting treasures none but Zion's children know. Doesn't Isaiah make you long for the day when God's transformation is complete and we are living as his people in the only ideal world for the whole of eternity. And in the meantime, the church, you and I, we are the city of the Lord. And as our lives reflect his glory, so our lives will draw other people to his life. Let's pray. And gracious Father, as we come to you just amazed, astounded at these incredible descriptions of the church, of us of what in some measure we are and what we ultimately will be. Father, help us to live this out in our lives. Help us to let you, by your word and by your spirit, continually transform us and help us to reflect your glory to the world in order that you may draw many people to yourself. Help us to do that this week, in Jesus' name.